So let's go ahead and uh, jump in. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the conversion optimization uh, system. Um, and I will tell you how we develop the system, but uh, this is going to be one of our shorter webinars. We typically do, do uh, those webinars for, uh, about, uh, for about an hour, 45 minutes to 55 minutes. So today we're trying something new and we're limiting them uh, to uh, only 30 minutes. So that means there's going to be a lot of content, a lot of resources that you can use, uh, that you can take and really apply. Um, and then apply like tomorrow and start seeing increases in conversion rates. So what am I going to be talking about in the next uh, 30 uh, minutes? So, um, and I want to set kind of expectations correctly. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, the bad experiences that we deal with in our day-to-day -day life. And to some extent, uh, we've accepted them. Uh, they just became a fact of life. Uh, so I want to talk about the kind of our vision for conversion optimization. And I'm not going to take too long about this, but I hope that the three, four minutes I take about this will make you start thinking about your website and about your business and how you're doing business offline and online. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a question that I hear all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go to Google right now and, and search for it, uh, you'll probably see our website as one of the top one or two results. Um, but I'm not going to just talk about this, you know, sometimes people tell me, well, this is all fluffy, you know, bullshit. No, I'm going to give you step-by-step -step process that you can apply and see an increase in uh, conversions. So this is a 14-step process, and we use this process with large enterprise companies. We've used them with 3M, we've used it with 3M, we've used it with eBay, uh, and we've used it with small startups. If I mentioned their name, you probably would not even recognize them. Uh, so you will see how those companies manage to do, use that process to increase their conversion rates. Then I'm going to talk about something new that we have, which is the uh, conversion, uh, conversion benchmark reports. So, so uh, quickly about invest so I can just uh, get my, uh, my marketing team off my back. Uh, what do we do? We are in the business of making you money. The competition becomes really a distant spark, becomes irrelevant when we work with you. That's really our goal. And how, we do, how do we do that? We create a delightful customer experience in every touch point that a person has with your, with your business. Um, now, how do we do that? Uh, we either we do it in one of two ways. Uh, sometimes companies uh, bring us to do full conversion optimization projects, and those different take different forms, either a full engagement or a landing page optimization or sometimes just an audit. Uh, another way, uh, some companies like to bring us to train their people and work, work with, their, with their team uh, to really help them figure out conversion optimization. Uh, and also, like you know, we'll consult with them as they are doing that. Which companies do we work with? We work with enterprise to uh, mid-sized companies that really are not, they're not able to move the needle, but we also work with fast-growing startups. Um, and I'll, I'll mention some examples of that as I go through, through my talk. So let's put that aside. Let me talk a little bit about just the, some of the experiences that we deal with. Sometimes we take things for granted. So recently, for those of you who have been following investment, we're one of the very first companies that have been doing conversion optimization, second company in the U.S. to do conversion optimization. Um, we've opened an international office, um, and that sounds like a gr sounded like a great idea. But what that meant is I have to rent an apartment. So I traveled kind of back and forth. Our headquarters is in, uh, in Detroit, uh, in Farmington Hills, to be more exact. Uh, our uh, other office is in Europe, and particularly in Istanbul, Turkey. And that meant I spent quite a bit of time traveling back and forth. And I had to rent an apartment in Istanbul. Now, mind you, I don't speak Turkish. I'm not Turkish. It just made sense for, for lots of, lots of reasons, which is a whole other discussion some other time. I search and I search, and finally I find the perfect apartment, nice new apartment complex. Um, you know, just like I figured, I'm like, okay, this is gonna be comfortable. I'm happy. I'm gonna live over here comfortably. I come here, like, and I spend two, three weeks, then I go back to the US. This is just gonna be great. I'm gonna talk to you about my experience from my day to day life. So, Move to the apartments, you know, get the apartment furnished, and the problems start showing up one after the next. So this is the entrance to my apartment complex. You can see that it's really new apartment complex. The only problem is that the architect uh, or whoever is responsible for planning left one lane, as you can see over here, for cars to go in. 
and basically, and for cars to go out, you can you can enter the apartment complex, but you can you can never leave. And this is such like it's a, it's a humongous apartment complex. It's such a stressful process entering, and such a stressful pro process leaving. Um, and, and I'm always like, you know, on my nerves, I'm like, oh my God, am I going to get in an accident or not? Because they just, it's something that you take for, for granted. Okay, so that's one problem. Um, I order food regularly because, you know, when I travel to Turkey, I'm single. And, you know, I order food and they, like, you know, they go to the security gate. They're trying to go in. They, like, you know, the security calls me, hey, restaurant is delivering, uh, delivering food. And I say, sure. And it takes them about 15 minutes after they go through security to get to my apartment. And I'm like, why is that the case? Why? Because the apartment building forgot to include, like as you see over here, like, you know, there's different levels, there's 17 stories, but they forgot to mention what apartment number is available or is located at each, uh, at which level, which means that restaurant, like, you know, delivery, you know, staff comes in and they have to go one level after the next or guess. And oh boy, I mean, on, on almost every other day, I run to this issue where they come and it's like, oh, it's unbelievable. It took us 15 minutes in your building to find your, your apartment. Now, this is, this is sort of funny because I was showing this to my staff and I'm like, okay, here's a picture from my kitchen. Can you tell what the problem is? And they looked at it and they said, well, no, we don't see what the problem. And I'm like, well, here's my dishwasher and above it is the cupboards, which I open. Phil said, okay, what's the big deal? I told them every time I empty the dishwasher, because of the way they designed the apartment and the cupboards, I end up banging my head. And it's just poorly, poorly designed. Like, and it would have been so simple for them to put the dishwasher on the other side, and it would save me probably lots of, like, you know, pain and, and, and misery. Um, at the end, I'm just extremely frustrated. It's like small, silly things. And I've had actually lots and lots of examples. And I'm like, okay, enough. So sometimes when I show these examples, people say, well, okay, so what does this have to do with the web? I mean, we're talking about like my websites and how we can make money on websites. And I'm like, no, it's extremely important. Why, like, you know, let's think about how much this, this costs. And I can, I can show you the math and you can look at it. What do you think, like, you know, if, if this on average takes me about only two minutes and there's 4,000 residents in the apartment complex that run into the same problems, and you know, let's let's do quick math. It really translates to almost three million six hundred fifty thousand dollars of lost revenue, of agony, of pain that four thousand people are going through on daily basis. And I, by the way, I know it takes me more than two 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 minutes per day. So okay, well okay, so the bad apartment complex. No, uh, let me give you another example. Something from the web. Something I had to go through uh, just this weekend. So I'm booking my flight back to Chicago. I'm going to visit a client over there, and I, I'm like, you know what, I mean, Turkish Airlines is, is, is just better than other airlines, they're a bit more expensive, they just released a new website, let me go ahead and book the airline ticket. So I go in and I search Istanbul to Chicago, and I'm like, okay, let, let's figure this out, and I get this screen, and as you can see the screen, I kept on looking at it, and I'm like, where is the CTA? Where do I click on next? And I was puzzled. I mean, here Turkish Airlines is charging me more money compared to United or British Airways, uh, almost $200 more, and I'm willing to pay that, no big deal. But, and I'm willing to give them the money. And I had my credit card in my hand, but because some usability guy thought, okay, or, or, or design guy thought, oh, well, you know, this will look nicer. Uh, I wonder if, like, you know, the webinar attendees can figure out, can you take a look at this and figure out where is the CTA on this page? I'll let you kind of ponder that question. So um, uh, another example that I always tell people, I'm like, you know, uh, every time you see a machine with a paper written on top of it and stuck to it, that means there was a problem in design. But let's go, let's go back for a second to Turkish Airlines. How much money do you think that they're losing by having the CTA not so clear? Let's assume that 10 or 20% of their visitors get frustrated. And, you know, believe me, like, you know, I'm somebody who spends time on the web all the time, and I got so extremely uh, frustrated. Let's say like, you know, about 10 or 20% of their visitors. What does that translate for them? Now, these are big companies. We're talking about $136 million of lost revenue. Big numbers that we're talking about. And lots of times when we talk about conversion optimization, people are saying, well, I'm fine. You know, I'm leaving your, your, and we always have sold it in the past as something that's, you know, you're leaving money on the table. No, you're not leaving money on the table. You're actually taking your own money and you're burning it on the table when you have poor usability, websites that don't do the functionality that people are expecting because you think you're smart, but maybe not. Maybe visitor, your visitors think that you are other uh, otherwise. Uh, something else, uh, we do this, and I've mentioned it, the conversion benchmark reports, where we benchmark different websites, 20 different criterias, uh, evaluating 
their conversion, like, you know, and, and how design, how well they are designed for, for conversion. What do you think the average website, uh, what's, uh, what's the average website score on that report out of 100? What do you think? Are we looking at, like, you know, you would think, like, you know, we're 2018 going to 2019. You would think that, you know, uh, that will be high. The average website score is at 55. That, that is just absolutely, absolutely horrible. You look at that and it's like, really? That's what like, you know, we are dealing with still in 2018 going into 2019? Now, let me jump in over here and I'm gonna mention to you that average is losing. What do I mean by that? Listen, lots of times people tell me, like my website is average and the reality of it, average is no longer average. Average is losing. What we are seeing nowadays is that there, when websites first start and they're able to drive very focused traffic to uh, marketing teams start and they're able to drive traffic, uh, targeted traffic to their websites, they're able to increase, they have high conversion rates as you see over here. Eventually, as they start increasing the traffic, it's less targeted, so conversion rates drop. And that's kind of typical for most websites. However, there are few uh, the few and the select, the exceptional websites that are able to drive significant amount of traffic and achieve significant increases in their conversion rates. And, and this system that you will see shortly, uh, I promise three, four more slides and we will get into it and show you the exact system and how you can implement it. This is the system that those websites are able to, uh, to achieve. So here's some things for you to think about. If you're not able to increase your conversion rates by 20 to 30% year after year, CRO should be a major initiative for you. And, and look at your competitors, look at what they're doing. Don't copy your competitors uh, because you know, they might not know what they're, what they're doing at all, but look at them. What are they doing? Are they able to increase their sales? Are they able to increase their marketing budgets? Are they capturing more share uh, compared to you or not? And even if you're the lead in, in a particular space, uh, look at the competition. Are they trying to catch up with you or, or not? Lots of times I hear people, like whenever they want to engage in conversion optimization, they say, hey, we want to focus on the low hanging fruit. And I sort of like, you know, I just published an article about, uh, about this. Whenever you're trying to achieve increased conversion rates for a website, there's different opportunities that you want to fix. Uh, there's the bugs where your website is just broke. You know, you're trying to go through a checkout, uh, you know, let's say you're an e-commerce website and the cart page is broke. People are not able to go through that. So that's just pure, purely like, you know, just an issue with the code. The next level is what we call usability issues. Uh, you saw that on the Turkish Airlines website that I just mentioned, where things are not behaving the way visitors expect them. And it's extremely important to focus on those two things like usability and bugs and have them because really this is about making the website easy to use for the visitors. But if you're looking to increase conversion rates uh, significantly, if you're looking to go from the one or two percent to the eight and nine and ten percent, if you're on e-commerce, if you're a SaaS at the twelve percent, if you're looking to go to the twenty or twenty-two percent, you you need to have your usability and bugs resolved. But then you need to look at the other two criteria. So you need to look at things that are stopping conversions. The website is usable. Uh, we figure out all the bugs in it, but there's still conversion issues. And you want to start thinking about motivators. How do I motivate visitors? And there's a huge difference between usability and conversion. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but let me kind of like, you know, put this for you to think about. When the website is usable and I, I am navigating to a website that's usable, the way I'm thinking, well, yeah, I can shop on this website. When the website is optimized for conversion, I'm not thinking I can buy on this website. I'm thinking I have to buy on this website. And there is a huge difference between, between the two. So spend some time and now we'll go through the process that's going to be next. Look at your website, identify the issues that you see on the website, bugs, UX, conversion issues, and really figure out what you can do to fix those issues. Okay, so let's talk about the process. Like I promised you, we're gonna go through the 14 steps process. Um, and there's plenty of resources. I think I've uh, counted about 24 different resources because really we teach this process in an eight day workshop and we teach it in, we teach it in a three day workshop, a two day workshop. Now I gonna condense it for you in 15 minutes, but the goal is just to spark your interest and you'll see the resources, you can read about it and implement them um, and, and really see significant increases in your conversion rates. So this is how the process and we use the acronym SHIP uh, scrutinize, hypothesize, implement, propagate, and comes also from shipping, shipping software. Uh, you're constantly like, you know, updating and shipping new releases for the software. Let's go through the process and how it, uh, how it works. So the very first uh, phase is what we call the scrutinize phase. 
the very first thing that you do before you even touch your website and start like, you know, thinking about your website, figure out what are visitors trying to accomplish on your website? What are the different scenarios that they that bring them to your website? Are they, if you're an e-commerce website, are they purely coming in to place an order? No, maybe they're coming to return an item. Maybe they're coming to check your shipping policies. Maybe they're comparing prices between you and a competitor. Uh, I was on intercom.io, love, love the software. We had a subscription that was canceled at some point and I was coming you know, back to reactivate it. This site does not take into account that scenario of somebody who had a subscription and is coming back to reactivate it. It was one of the most confusing sites and visitor flows that I had. And I was sitting there, I'm like, you know what? For somebody who does usability and conversion, and have been doing it now for over 15, 18 years, and I get confused, imagine your average user. Why would you build that to your website? So figure out the different scenarios that bring people to the website. Let's think about those scenarios. Because ultimately, although we are going to be making changes to the site, we're making changes to the business process. But what we are trying what, what we are trying to do is optimize the experience for the visitor, a particular experience for the visitor. You give the visitors what they want, they give you what you want. What they want is a delightful experience. What you want is money in the bank. I think it's a win-win relationship. So we identify the experiences. This is a sample file that you can fill with different experiences. And then, uh, typically, by the way, you identify anywhere between five to 15 primary experiences on the website. First step, we finish that. Usually it takes about two to three days. You can finish it probably like in two to three hours. It depends on how detailed you want to go. Uh, here are some resources, and like I said, uh, there's plenty of resources that uh, the goal from it, you know, kind of cover this topic, but you can click on those links and uh, you will, we'll send you a webinar recording uh, so you can download those resources and read them and go through them step, step by step. Second thing that we do, okay, so we've identified the experiences. Now let's go through an expert review. What does that mean? You yourself, you sit in with a couple of other people, preferably people who have not seen the website. And you say, let's say, you know what, maybe the first experience if you're an e-commerce website is somebody coming in and searching for, uh, let's say an iPhone X, let's say you sell iPhones and he's gonna come to our website and he's gonna search for an iPhone X and he's gonna find the best price and compare us to a competitor. And you sit and you watch uh, the, the, the other two people who are sitting with you and you can ask friends you can go maybe to a coffee shop to a Starbucks offer somebody a free cup of coffee and it will be one of the best investments you, you've ever made and just watch them interact with your with your website watch them struggle I always call this the crying game as in crying tears in your eyes because people are always shocked uh, when, when you know when they go through that it's like well I didn't expect people to act that way of course you did not expect them to that to act that way I mean if you expect them to act in a certain way and then you discover that the behavior is completely different that explains why you have bad conversions on your website there's different methods to conduct the expert review 10 heuristics the pure method uh, conversion framework analysis uh, I'll share some resources that you can go through here is an example lots of times people ask me like how many items you identify in an expert review we've had a client startup a uh, small startup which is sort of like you know uh, I always mention them because they did so well started with us doing half a million annual revenue which is very little a year and a half later they are doing six million dollars in annual revenue incredible growth website was three pages that's it home page cart page and checkout which was hosted checkout so we could not even touch that how many issues did we identify for them when we went through the uh, the heuristic analysis? We've identified 81 issues on two pages. The thing is, you just want to invest the time in identifying those issues. Step three, you go through qualitative research. Very fancy name, but really what it means, talk to your customers, talk to your actual website users, ask them, what are you trying to accomplish? Why did you come to our website today? What, what is like, you know, what are the motivators? What's stopping you from converting? What can we do better? Um, you know, the, the, the best information that comes to you will come from your customers. You need to collect enough data, and enough data, by the way, varies from one website to the next. With some website, maybe 10 people, you know, answering your poll, and, and these, we're talking about online polling, can really help you uh, understand uh, what are some of the issues that people are dealing with. But it's not enough just to collect the data. It's important to figure out, okay, what do we do next? People said that they love this or they hate this particular feature. That's something that you kind of like, you know, pile all these issues that you're gathering. You gather some issues from the expert review. You're gathering some issues from the quality of the research. You'll gather some issues. It's kind of a, a journey of discovery, discovering oneself, crying, looking in the mirror, feeling painful, and kind of going through the process. 
then you go through quantitative research. What does that mean? Fancy name again. And by the way, this is one of the areas I'm like, you know what? Do people understand what qualitative and quantitative? I mean, they're fancy names. We could have told them, like we could have called them, talk to customers and look at data, look at analytics, look at heat maps, look at video recording sessions. Um, and again, you'll see some resources that will help guide you through the process. Lots of times when people look at analytics, they're just looking at the number of page views, bounce rate, exit rate. Please don't do that. Um, I can train my 12-year-old daughter, and I've done that for her to look at those numbers. What you need to do is you need to set up different funnels on your website. See where the website is leaking visitors, what areas are performing really well, and then ask yourself, why is a particular area working really well? Why is this particular area not working so well? Um, somebody came to me and said, well, my website is two pages. You know, they come into the home page, they go to the services page, and then they click on the contact us. Well, I told them, like, do you know what's the drop-off rate between those two pages, between those three pages? He said, no, I haven't thought about creating a funnel for that. I'm like, why not? Uh, you want to segment the website, look at this data and understand what works and what doesn't. Look at different browsers, look at different screen resolutions, different uh, devices. That can be extremely insightful. Again, when you're looking at data, you need to think about, okay, what is this data telling you? What's, what's my next action? It's always about identifying issues and compiling them in that kind of big list. Uh, we've identified issues from the expert review, from the, when we talk to the customers, qualitative and from quantitative. Here are some resources for you uh, to be able to conduct all the stuff that we talked about when it comes to heuristic, when we talked about looking like, you know, at Google Analytics and how you conduct that correctly. Then you do some usability testing. This is where you already have the scenarios, you already have the experiences that was the very first thing that you started with, and you go either bring some people, you know, again, you know, going to going uh, going out for lunch. Um, I like to go to Panera. I would find somebody who's sitting on a table. I'm like, hey, can I buy you lunch? And it's like people find it very strange. I'm like, no, I'll buy you, I'll buy you lunch, but can I ask you to do this on my website? I was like, sure. Like, and I was like, for me, it's the best $15 investment that I make. And I watch them as they are going through my website and I discover what are the issues that they're facing. There, we've written a lot about usability testing so you can use those resources to uncover issues on your, on your website. Now, why do I use all these methods? Why do I do usability testing, qualitative, quantitative, expert review? Why do I identify experiences? There's some companies that love to look at the website through quality. Some companies swear by talking to people. Some people, the, the analytics guys, love the data. And they're like, oh, who cares about the touchy-feely? The UX companies love to just talk to people. I was like, oh, every testing is bad. I'm like, no. There are different prisons that will give you insights on what works and what doesn't work on your website. And if the only tool is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. We've gathered all these issues. Now we're going to start classifying them, you know, because you, you discover issues as you're going through the, your website. And again, remember the example. We, when we gone with that startup and we uncovered you know, almost 80 issues for them, how do we classify them? Sometimes you go through the list of items and you discover that, hey, there's a bug over here. Let's fix it right away. I don't need an A-B test. I don't need to ask anybody. Um, you know, I give a good example. A client came to us and said, checkout is like, you know, people, like we deployed a new checkout and people, basically our checkout abandonment rate dropped horrendously. Like, you know, it, uh, sorry, increased horrendously. It's like almost up to 93%. I'm like, well, let me take a look. It doesn't even need a, a project. I come in, I go through it and ask you to create a username, password. Sure, I have a standard username, password. Lo and behold, no, your password is too weak. Okay, let me try my other stronger password. Weak, the third stronger password, weak. And I'm like, okay, random letters, still weak. I go back to the developer and I say, what's going on here? He's like, well, you know, I wanna make sure that people use strong passwords. And I'm like, well, you also make sure that people are not placing orders with the website. Fix it right away. So you look at the items and you say, there's something that we know for sure, the website is broke, we need to fix it right away. Sometimes you need to instrument. What does that mean? Google Analytics, I mean, everybody has Google Analytics. Sometimes you're, if you're a larger company, Omniture, there's other analytics solutions. But what I see is really like, you know, they just did the basic script drop and then they're done. Garbage in, garbage out, people. You gotta make sure that you're collecting the right data, the right profiles, the right segmentation, no pollution, uh, funnels are configured correctly. If you don't do that, really is gonna kill your analysis. It's gonna kill you completely. You're, you're working off of nothing. 
sometimes you see that there's research opportunity. You see like a certain visitor behavior or you know, as, as you're conducting a usability test and you see something and you're like, huh, I wonder why people are behaving this way. So that is what we call a research, um, a research opportunity is where we say, you know what, I think I, I know why because the headline is not like, you know, didn't resonate well with people and we're not using social proof and the whole business process is broke. So we come up with what we call like, we think we know how to fix this. So we put those as research opportunities. Sometimes you see what we call investigate further. People are telling me that they really hate the way, like, you know, you, like, you know, the copy that you use on your website. Well, let's ask them further. What kind of copy? Was it the tone? Was it that we use, like, you know, a language that did not connect with them? Uh, you hear things from people and you're not sure how to fix the problem. So you say, you know what? I need to investigate this problem further. So these are your buckets. Fix right away, which is bugs, instruments, analytics issues, Research opportunities, that's really where you're gonna say, oh, you know, I have a problem, but I think I have a solution to it, and investigate further. That is scrutinize. The most difficult portion of a conversion optimization project is the scrutinize. And if you do it correctly, um, you can end up with 200, 300 items. You can end up with 100 items, but really bread and butter. That's how you're gonna increase your conversion rates. Next step is hypothesize. So we have the list, what do we do with it? Uh, this is kind of a typical list for us. So you can't tackle 100 items. No one has the time or the resources or the energy. So what you do is you prioritize those items. Now, there are different frameworks out there to prioritize items. Um, I can test that. You know, I've studied those frameworks quite a bit, use them quite a bit. I think the framework that we use is probably more comprehensive. It takes more time to fill, but it really forces you to think about the different items that you have and we'll give you a final prioritization and I will link to it as well. Go through it, it's detailed. It asks you for each one of the items, asks you 18 different questions. And people tell me, it's like, oh man, I have to do that? I'm like, yes, you're talking about increasing conversion rates. Whoever told you that increasing conversion rates is a light switch you turn on and off, changing a color of a, of a button, changing a headline, nah, just lied to you. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, increasing conversion rates is about understanding human psychology and it takes lots of time and effort. We've prioritized our list. Most of the work is done. It really is. Because next thing we do is we take the top of the list and we start creating hypotheses. Now, lots of times I see people creating hypotheses that are just sad. Um, and, and a good hypothesis should tell you what the problem is why like you know you think it's a problem because we you know we discovered this through analysis through research through like you know uh, through like our qualitative research through online polling through analytics and also a good hypothesis would tell would tell you that we expect that you know making the xyz change will increase our conversion rates by 10 12 you know 15 percent it sets a goal for your team to work off of uh, or against now, I see that I am almost at the 30 minutes mark. I'm going to continue for about five more minutes. I promise, like, you know, I wouldn't take, uh, I wouldn't take longer. Uh, a good hypothesis will include the target. And people always tell me, it's like, wow, difficult. How do you know? I tell them, have you ever seen people play basketball? You know, when they're just, you know, shooting the, you know, the hoops around and they're not keeping track of the score, eh, everybody's lazy. You can always tell when they're not keeping score. When they keep score, when they say, you know what, we're going to keep score their attitude changes. When you include a specific target in your hypothesis, I'm making this change and I expect an 8% uplift in conversion rates, a 12% increase in conversion rates, and 18%. It changes the attitude of everybody and gets them highly invested. We have a hypothesis, you know, we have the problem, we have the hypothesis on what to kind of fit, how to fix it. Now you sit with your designer and you come up with a design that actually fixes that the problem uh, according to the hypothesis. Now, this is an area where I see people make mistakes because they say, you know what, uh, but let's just go ahead and fix the header. And I've always wanted to fix also like, you know, the side and re this looks, looks really bad. And the new design they come up with had nothing to do with the original hypothesis. It's fine if you want to do that, but don't kid yourself. You're not doing an A-B test in that case. You're not doing a usability test. You're not doing conversion optimization. You're just making changes on your own, <laughs> just guessing. and. If there's one thing about conversion optimization, we don't like to do that. Everything is very structured. Everything follows a process. I created my designs. Great, I'm ready. So now what you do? Now you're ready you know, to the third stage, which is the implementation. That's when you go into the A-B testing or usability testing, by the way. First thing you do before you go fancy and wild and you deploy your A-B 
tests on your website, you know, implement them. There's, uh, I'll, I'll also share some resources on that. Things that you really have to read. Um, I see two types of people, people who are doing A-B testing constantly, and they're saying, oh, it's so easy, but then when you talk to them about all the statistics behind it, they don't have a clue. Uh, I'm part of like, you know, some Facebook groups, and I see these people who are saying, oh, I ran a test, and like, you know, the original had 10 conversions, and the variation had like, you know, 20 conversions, and like, you know, the software told me I've had a winner. No, you did not. The software lied to you, the A-B testing software, and you do not understand enough about statistics that you accepted that lie. And I see other people who say, we don't believe in A-B testing. And I always tell them, like, you don't believe in A-B testing? Um, how about medicine? You take any medicine? The same statistical methods that are used in A-B testing have been used for a century now in determining, like, you know, different, like, you know, medicines and how they're, how they're effective. That's what the FDA uses, ultimately. We're not inventing anything new. The method has been around for literally, like, on some of, some of the research, like, you know, two, over 200 years in terms of kind of statistical, statistical methods. Now, one thing that you want to think about, you don't always have to conduct an A-B test. Sometimes you have the new design, you just conduct the usability test. Not, not every test should be run as an A-B test. And people always find that strange whenever I, I, I talk about it because I'm, you know, we run a conversion optimization company, one of the more most successful ones. Um, but, and I always tell them, like, I don't always have to run A-B tests. Ultimately, my goal is to increase your revenue as, as, a, as a client, make you successful, make your competition irrelevant. I can accomplish that goal through usability testing as long as I understand you know, what metrics I'm measuring. Also, sometimes people do usability testing without thinking. Like, oh, well, we did a usability test. People say it's better. I'm like, what does that mean? What does it's better mean? There's specific metrics that you want to look at when you're evaluating your original design and the new design. There's some instances where you do A-B testing. Now, this is important. We're a conversion optimization company. A-B testing is only one step out of 14 steps, guys. Um, it's not the holy grail of conversion optimization. It's not the holy grail of like, you know, increasing, making more money. It's an extremely important process. Google runs on average about, I think it's like, you know, 100,000 tests, around 100,000 tests last year. Amazon is running like, you know, close to 10,000 tests a year. Uh, you log into Facebook right now, there is a chance that you're in 10 different A-B tests. It's great, but again, it's a method. You gotta understand it, you gotta know how to use it. Lots of resources on A-B testing, and I could have done probably a second page for A-B testing, but I really think it's extremely important that you, you know what you're walking into, so you are not surprised, and you know, you, you know exactly what kind of statistics you need, to, you need to understand. So I'm gonna leave this slide for a second. We've done our A-B testing. Not every A-B test will succeed. Some A-B tests will, some wouldn't. Um, you go into the propagate phase. After you finish your testing, and this is the last stage, what do we do in the propagate? We do a post-test analysis. What did we learn from the test? Was where, or as we were trying to increase conversions by 12 percent. Well, you know, the results showed us that we increased conversions by 18 percent, or the results showed us that we actually did not increase our conversions at all. Why? What do we do? Do we create another test? Do we, you know, decide to go to a completely different direction? There is a lot of analysis that needs to go, that needs to happen post any A/B test. And then you share and you educate. A good conversion optimization program changes the way you think about every single interaction with your customer from the minutes you, like, you know, somebody looks at your sign or it comes to interact, if you, if you have something offline to picking up the phone, every little detail must be, must be optimized. Now, when you do conversion optimization, when you do conversion optimization, when you do A-B testing, on average, by the way, uh, most companies do 10% of their tests are successful. Only 10%, which is not very good. That's worse than flipping a coin. Uh, for us at Invest, we're very proud. So we achieved 3.5, three, uh, 3.5x 3 uh, the, the industry result. Our success rate is close to, at this point, close to the 40%, 38%, which is really amazing. You will have winners. You will have losers. You know, and you got to kind of keep that, keep that in mind. It's called testing. It's not certainty. If you know for sure, then don't do A-B tests. Look, you're testing to see. You have an assumption. You have a hypothesis. And you want to see your visitors validated or not. But the beauty of A-B testing is you'll have one of those big wins, and you'll have them in a year, you might have them two, three, four times where you have significant increases in conversion rates. Some resources for you on the propagate stage as well, and I, I wanna keep uh, my promise, I only have one last slide. So this is the process. We are gonna share a recording of the webinar, but I also wanna talk to you about the conversion benchmark report because that's something that 
we are like you know seeing lots of demand. We just had like you know, a couple of like, you know, large companies ask uh, ask us for it. Um, uh, this is a special offer today. Uh, really like you know the benchmark report. We are offering it at no cost to you. Basically, we assess your website using 20 different factors that impact conversion. Now, how do you get that benchmark report? Uh, my uh, our director of uh, client engagement, Mohammed, uh, will be reaching out to you. The goal from that. Two things. First, I would like to hear some feedback from you. Yeah, and this is about talking to customers, correct? Qualitative research. You can tell us whether the webinar was helpful, I was too fast, I spent too much time at the beginning. Those are the concerns I have. <laughs> so I'm just sharing it with you. Or was it great? Would you other topics you'd like to hear on our webinars? Really, I would appreciate your feedback on that. Um, and if you're interested in the conversion benchmark reports, uh, if you know somebody who might be interested in it will benefit from it, mention it to Mohammed um, and tell him, hey, we would like to get that done for us or maybe like you know, for one of our like you know colleagues. Now, the benchmark report takes us a while to put together and now like, you know, there's a bit of backlog, but for our webinar attendees, Mohammed will be reaching out to you shortly. So get on that list um, and, and see, uh, like I said, the average website is doing about uh, 55 out of 100. Uh, you can always connect with me. Uh, this is my LinkedIn profile, Twitter as well. Uh, this is my email address. I hope you guys have found the information useful. We will be, uh, our next webinar will be talking about creating kick-ass growth teams. How do we do that? What, what works? What doesn't work? Uh, with that, I appreciate you giving us the time. And until uh, next time, happy conversions.